I'm an engineering geologist Fugger, with, with Fugger William Ledison Associates, Keith Kelson, and if you're on this list, you know who you are, so I'm just going to skip right through that um, very quickly. Um, I wanted to thank uh, Pierre and EERI for uh, asking me to provide a geologic foundation for this, so I'll be very brief on uh, the basics. Uh, the Nazca plate is being, was being, is being subducted beneath South American plate. That was the cause of the earthquake. Um, basically, the intensities um, were substantial, as Jack just mentioned. And I'm showing here the, um, I just want to briefly go through this um, overall model that shows the, uh, the rupture model in 3D right here where a couple of uh, slip distributions were, uh, slip focuses were on the, the actual slide plane. It is the Nazca plate subducting underneath the South American plate as shown in the geologic cross section here, alignment of uh, seismicity underneath the South American plate. The distances to some of the larger towns that we'll see some damage in are relatively small, only 25 kilometers below some of the larger populated areas. And again, all of this information is available on the USGS website as well. But what, just very briefly, what, what um, the subduction zone is that the Nazca plate is subducting underneath the South American plate. The overriding plate gets stuck as the, the, uh, the plates converge, and that stuck patch becomes the fault rupture patch. Uh, while it's stuck aseismically prior to the earthquake, the areas to the, in this case, to the east of the, uh, of the fault uh, have a seismic uplift, and the areas uh, to the west along the fault plane have um, uh, subsidence. During the earthquake, the, the stuck patch becomes unstuck. The, basically, a flap uh, moves up, and so there are areas that have net uplift, sudden uplift during the earthquake, and there are areas uh, further east, in this case, of sudden sub subsidence. This occurs in uh, typical in subduction zone earthquakes. Uh, one of the things that we looked at in the geologic uh, reconnaissance for, for this was to identify the hinge line. That's the, the fulcrum of the seesaw, the, the areas that don't change in net elevation. Uh, some areas go up, some areas go down, but there's a hinge line of zero uplift or zero subsidence, and we track that. And I'll, I'll make a note later that this is a, a very important point during this earthquake. But I also wanted to make the same point that Dr. Maley made was the, the vast extent of this earthquake was, was really part of, of the story. And just as a, as a guide, there's a 600-kilometer long bar here between, as, he, as Jack just mentioned, between Santiago and Temuco. It's basically the area of, of strong shaking. And for those of us here in California, it's comparable to the distance between San Francisco and Los Angeles. So right there made our earthquake recon uh, of quite an undertaking. To, uh, to cover that much area. But more relevant is the, uh, the, the application or the comparison with the Pacific Northwest and the, <laughs> Pacific Northwest and the, um, the Cascadia subduction zone, and that distance is comparable to, to that from Seattle all the way down to California. So the distances are quite big. Now, placing that rupture map in place uh, from the USGS onto uh, Chile gives this, and then if we compare that to the uh, to the Cascadia subduction zone, that would be a comparable amount. Now, we don't really know that this occurred, but I just placed that on there so it's, it's not truth, okay? It's just on there. Uh, let's go to the geology, uh, because the ge geology does control some of the strong ground motions that other folks will talk about in a minute. But basically, the Andes are composed of uh, volcanic rocks. We have a central valley, very similar to here in, in Northern California, a central valley filled with alluvium, and then a coastal range. Uh, by analogy to Cascadia would be similar to the, to the coastal range up there as well. If you were to guess at Neherp soil classifications, this is what you might get. Basically, the Central Valley has, has weak soils, unconsolidated soils. And if you place the intensity diagram over there, you can see that there are anticipated to be high intensities in that Central Valley and in the coastal range. And just qualitatively, these are observations of where some of the, the more damaged towns are. Now, there's damage throughout the area. Again, remember, this is about 600 kilometers between Santiago and Temuco. There's damage throughout that, but this is the areas where there's substantial amount of damage within uh, the urban areas. 
Okay, now I want to move to the coastal uplift, which is quite an interesting story. This is a, uh, a map that shows the amount, uh, it's a model from uh, Wang and Hu on the amount of uplift here and contoured in colors uh, resulting from this earthquake where there was substantial amounts of, off, uh, of uplift in the offshore regions and then substantial amounts, um, as much as a meter of subsidence in that same central valley uh, that the highway runs down and most of the transmission corridors run down. We looked at the, the relative uplift and subsidence of the coastline and what we, what we know now, just in short, is that it's not constant from north to south. There are some areas that go up and some areas that went down. Let me give you a couple examples. Pichilemu, up here in the north, based on marine relationships in the tidal zone, we can say that there's relatively no uplift at this location, basically a static. So Pichilemu was essentially at what we're calling that hinge line, right about here. The hinge line on this diagram would be in the light blue, something like this. On the other side, relatively high uplift in the Arauco Peninsula, as shown here. You can see the uplifted wave cut platform uh, in that area is uplifted about two to two and a half meters. So all of the, um, the sea life in that area has been now exposed. An example from the town of Lebu, which is also in this area right here, the, the wave cut platform has come up about two meters, stranding uh, the sea life and uh, making this lighthouse, which used to be on an island, it's now on a peninsula. So the entire coastline rose a couple of meters. As a result, this is the geotechnical uh, uh, effect, is that the harbor has become unusual, unusable. Basically, all of the fishing fleet is now stranded. They're grounded on the sand shoals that have been uplifted a couple of meters. On the contrary, up to the north in, in a little town called Iloka, right here, um, there's been net subsidence, and you can see that by the grassy area that's now affected by wave erosion at low tide. The area has been dropped down about a half a meter or a meter, and as a result, or coincidentally, these towns were hit very hard with the tsunami. Iloka uh, was, uh, there are several residential areas that were um, wiped clean, basically. To summarize all of those observations, Iloka and Constitucion were hit very hard with the, with the tsunami. And they're also in the area where the hinge line is offshore. They were uh, located in areas where the, the shoreline subsided as much as a meter. And that somehow correlates with the amount of tsunami run-up damage. There was also tsunami damage uh, in Dichato and Concepcion that's been documented and will continue to be documented. Those are probably related to the proximity to the, um, to the epicentral area and to uh, tsunami hydraulics. It's not something we directly address, but there, there are some uh, tsunami damage outside in the areas of minor uplift. So as a final demonstration of that, I just wanted to come back to Lebu, the town of Lebu, right here with the harbor. And the, uh, the lighthouse that I mentioned earlier was right here that's been uplifted about two meters. Because of that uplift, the tsunami essentially didn't affect Lebu at all. This is a pre-earthquake uh, tsunami inundation zone map. And um, what I want to demonstrate here is that next, the areas that uplifted, the emergent areas, now the shoreline is out here and out here. And uh, oh, for reference, uh, the town of Lebu here, there's a bridge uh, that goes across this, uh, this tributary. It's the same bridge as this one. And in this picture, you can see all of the, the stranded fishing fleet in here from the uh, Lebu Harbor and all of the stranded boats that are up in here. These lucky boats right here are the ones that were out at sea during the earthquake, and now they can't get into the harbor. But from field observations, we can say that the tsunami didn't affect the town at all. It basically was protected by the uplift, by the two meters of uplift that kept the entire tsunami wave up into the tributary and uh, no damage to the town at all, effectively. That's probably the biggest uh, uh, coastal uplift story. And uh, one last comment just uh, on landslides also, because that's of common interest to geotechnical engineering, is that the landslides were relatively few. There was some uplift on the coastal area and some landslides and this dark picture of multiple debris flows in the area. But the reason for that probably is that uh, 
we had very low soil moistures during, during the earthquake. It was the end of the summer, and there was uh, anomalously few landslides uh, for that. That's all I'd like to say on the geotechnical thing and pass it over to uh, Dr. John Bray with UC Berkeley.